Yeah. I have not really slept. <laughs> All right. All right, I think maybe we can start. Yeah. So welcome everyone for this uh, Ask Me Anything session. So this is something uh, a bit new. Uh, I think this is the first time we, uh, we do this for, for FSE. So the idea is that uh, there is a famous cryptographer that is invited and you can ask any question to this researcher. Um, of course, it has to be related somehow to cryptography, to uh, security maybe uh, his career um, and you can write all your questions so in the chat as usual this uh, uh, special channel um, in which you can ask a question uh, there's already a lot of questions and, and this is really great but of course you can ask uh, many more and we, treat, we try to fit uh, all of them if we can um, so i'm i'm um, really uh, um, happy and i think we're all very lucky to have uh, Johan damon as an uh, invitee today for this uh, asking anything session so he's professor at Radboud University in Eichmichen. And I think, uh, yeah, I don't need to present uh, Johan. He's probably one of the most famous uh, researchers in the world. He uh, co-designed uh, Rind <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, he co-designed uh, Rindel, uh, which is the AES uh, winner for BlockCypher, the this competition. He also co-designed uh, Ketchak hash function, who won the SHA-3 uh, competition of the NIST. Um, so I think, uh, well, actually, there's a small st statistic for Johan. He uh, actually won 100% of the NIST competition he participated to. So I think this uh, actually says a lot about his achievement. Um, uh, he's also actually very famous for the names of the primitive uh, that he's uh, that is giving. Um, so actually, I, I reserve myself the right to not pronounce some of the, his primitive name if I feel like I cannot make it. So I would just replace this with some random, uh, random like banana or any fruit or whatever. Uh, so welcome, Yuan. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of questions already. I would like just to start with a very short one, maybe just to also uh, uh, introduce a little bit of yourself. So maybe you share how you actually get um, introduced to crypto. How did you end up working in crypto, in symmetric crypto? How did you get interested in, in this? Yeah. Yeah, I was in uh, Leuven uh, studying engineer. I think it was an electrotechnical mechanical engineer or something. And in the last year, we had a course, communication, something, communication systems or something. And uh, Bart Preneel gave a guest lecture there. He was a teaching assistant of Professor Govart, and he gave a lecture on cryptography. And he said that uh, their uh, research group, COSIC, had left with all the books and all the material and they had a spin-off. So they, they created a spin-off. And the group now then consisted of Bart Preneel and Anton Bosselaars. So people in Kosik will know who Anton Bosselaars is. He's still there. Bart also, by the way. And uh, he said, yeah, we're desperately looking for um, people doing a PhD. And uh, I was in the last year and I thought, do I have to go to work soon? So I really felt like uh, un not, let's say, mature enough to go and have a real job. And then I thought maybe I can just apply there for uh, being, uh, doing a PhD in that group. So when I went to uh, Professor Govart and he accepted me and that was it. And then I tried out some, some different subjects and that didn't go well. I, I lost quite some time. I was without any direction. There was also not so much guidance, I must say. But at some point, um, and then they asked me to look at uh, Cellular, cellular automata based crypto. So uh, Wolfram, you remember, you know Wolfram probably. Uh, oh, this is his first name again. Uh, um, sorry? It's Stephen Wolfram. Stephen oh, Wolfram. Stephen. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry, he had proposals, and um, we had also a colleague that was into these things, uh, Andre Barbet and, at Kosik. Well, he was not in Kosik, but. Uh, and he said, look, take a look at that. And I took a look at that. and. Um, yeah, that's how it started. And then I got kind of sucked into it. And from then on, it never really, uh, yeah. I'm still doing the same thing uh, more than 30 years later. Okay. Um, okay, uh, actually, yes. The, the first question I got, uh, <laughs> I think is, is on this from Gaetan. What is your inspiration from naming your primitives? Yeah, Do you have like a common, a common thread to all these uh, special names? No, it's just uh, if you if you publish something, you must have a name, and it's always um, 
something specific for the circumstance. So I cannot give a generic explanation, but I can give explanations for particular choices. But uh, some of these choices I don't want to talk about, but you can uh, find out um, by looking at the name and you can Google a bit, you can find out stuff, but some things will be hard to find, I think. But um, uh, yeah, you can give me a name and see if I answer the question. So th there's no bias like on Scrabble, you use the letter which high points, I mean, it really looks like this. No, no, it's, it's always, it's more like, um, well, inspired by the music I like at that moment or some, some inside joke or, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite different every time. Okay. Yeah, there's more um, something to when I'm, for instance, at Dash Tool and it's getting late and we had some drinks, then I will explain that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, that's a, a cool. All right. Um, also, I, I think one, actually, two um, um, questions at the same time. If you had to uh, design Ketchak again, would you change anything? And uh, the same question for, for AS. Yeah. I mean, for Rydal. Yeah, so for Ketchak, you could say that we did the uh, Zudu. So Zudu is kind of the improved version of Ketchak. Maybe Zudu for hashing, the permutation is a bit small. Um, although it works, right? Zodiac does hashing. Uh, but one could imagine that for, um, for uh, hashing, something double the size would be better. Uh, but uh, Zudu has a, already a lot of improvements over Ketchak in my opinion. So the, the way the, the it's, it's very similar, but still we get much better bounds. And that's because we now much better understand how to, how to get a better structure. Uh, as for a yes, so it's, of course, it depends on what the question is. If you tell me you have to design a 128 bit block cipher, yeah, because that was the requirement at the time, then um, I, I would say uh, Nukeon, because Nukeon we made at the same time. And actually, when I started on Nukeon, it, didn't, it was not called like that. Um, we wanted to do, do, do sub, two submissions to the AES competition. Uh, but Nukeon was not ready. So we started this project several times. And only when we started with Gilles and Mikael, so Vincent Raymond, Gilles, Mikael, and me, did we get Nukeon. So I think I always preferred Nokian over, uh, over Rijndaal, but it's much harder to sell. So uh, Rijndaal, you see that is even now people are still looking into these MDS matrices, huh? which I think is a very bad idea. I think Nokian is much better structure, it's much more efficient. And uh, well, people now, um, they make new lightweight ciphers and they always have a hard time competing with Nokian. So you see it stood the test of time. And I think it got, um, it was in the Nessie competition, if you remember, and it got eliminated in a particularly nasty way. Yeah, I see. So actually, of course, um, that wouldn't make a block cipher anymore, of course. Right? If now there would be an AS competition, I would say, but we should not go for block ciphers. That's what I would say. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, one side question on this, you were saying that um, to Kitschak, then you would, uh, potentially you think that uh, you get something improved now. So would you think that in 10 years we could do even better? Or now you think that's for how we understand how diffusion works and how we can get proper structure to achieve all that? Do you think we still have some margins for improvement or? Yes, well, uh, there is one thing is getting good diffusion and the other thing is proving what you got. Huh? So that's the attractive aspect of uh, the, the aligned approach behind the AES, you get these bounds that are immediate and all that, but you get also these side effects that you get truncated. A lot of attacks work much better in a uh, strongly aligned context. So in the weakly aligned context, you have to work very hard to get your bounds, but once you got them, they're much more powerful, I think. And I uh, am strongly, and I'm, I'm, I'm always saying I, but I'm actually speaking for uh, the people I work with too. Huh? So uh, Ketchup team and so on. So, um, I think it's uh, this weekly aligned approach is uh, much more promising. And even the bounds we got now, uh, they're already better. So I, yeah, I think Zudu, there could be some improvements we could do, uh, but yeah, let's see. Um, and um, going for a bigger permutation would also be a good idea. So the, there's other things you can do. You can also work with um, uh, the permutation with, um, uh, so now it's always the same. You get some kind of 
nonlinear layer that is uniform and it treats all the bits in the same way and then you get a linear layer that treats all the bits in the same way but for instance in the paper on uh, Fritz, we did something different and you're not you don't have to treat all the bits the same way uh, and it's good in principle lead to something that is more efficient i don't know but uh, it will be harder to prove uh, because these bounds are much harder to prove because you get it's much harder to program so this this structure with a full nonlinear layer and a full linear layer that's easier to 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 get these bounds i think but i think there's room for progress but it will be rather incremental i think so it's maybe the bounds get much better but the number of rounds by which you can reduce is not going to be uh, dramatic anymore so you can maybe go from six to five rounds in Farfalle or something like that i see well that's just my opinion of course yeah um, still a question, or what uh, if you go back in time, etc. Um, yeah. If you go back in time, what would you like to ask to Claude Shannon? Yeah, I saw that question, but I, I really don't know so much about Claude Shannon. That is, I mean, I respect a lot what he did, and uh, this information theory is really great. And uh, his work on crypto, I know much less. So I wouldn't know what to ask Claude Shannon, to be honest. Uh, I, I have no affinity uh, with him. Um, so we got also a question, maybe more on the details on how you use the sponges. Um, so from Jan, what is your ideal value, size, and rate, VR, for permutation-based cryptography, both for unkeys and key mode? Yeah, but that, that depends on the use case. So if you want to be really lightweight, huh, then um, what, what we did, for instance, in subterranean, we tried to get a small state. Huh? Actually, what we did in subterranean, just take some old stuff and uh, clean it up and make it modern. That's what we did, but in practice, there's 257 bits, that's really small. And um, if you look at that in, uh, when you use it in duplex or as a sponge, yeah, so in, in our SAE mode, there is not much overhead. So like uh, Bach Manning presented this uh, elephant. And of course there the permutation is one only 160 bits, but there's a lot of overhead. Well, in our duplex, there is really almost no overhead. So it gives, you can also see that in the, in the comparison, the benchmark hardware comparison, that it's really small. Um, so in that case, you got, you can only afford a small rate. And if you can only afford a small rate, uh, because you have, you need a large capacity. Uh, if you only can, can afford a small rate, then um, to be efficient, you cannot do many rounds. And that's, we reduce that to one round. But as soon as you start doing one round and you start doing duplex, uh, squeezing and absorbing with one, rate, rate, uh, one round in between, you need a nonce, right? So if you say, yeah, we cannot manage a nonce, then you need to make a bigger state. So it's all, it all depends on the circumstance. But uh, in, in my opinion, the, the, um, the direction for efficient uh, permutation-based crypto is more like what we did with Farfalle, you know, where you uh, basically have two phases, a compression phase and an expansion phase, and in between some buffers, some, some extra rounds, and, um, you, you can afford to reduce the number of rounds in the compression and the expansion phase a lot. And there is no rate or capacity because you do full width uh, injection and full width uh, squeezing. Thanks. Um, okay, we have new question coming in. Um, so maybe a, a question from Christina. As you have worked for both industry and academia, what advice would you give you? Would you give to PhD students or postdocs that want to continue to do research, but they hesitate between the two options? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, but I, I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, I can give a good answer. So I was never uh, really um, when when, for instance, I did my PhD, um, and months before I, I presented my had to defend my PhD, I, I got the word that my contract had ended for some administrative reason. And I was standing on the street and I had to go look for a job. And then I went to um, industry and I got a job at a big multinational in kind of IT support. So it was very hard at that time to get a job in security, let alone crypto. And I was really miserable for one year. But what I did find out was that in academia, I thought I knew everything. I've always the tendency to think I know everything, but that's of course not true. But then I really thought that. And I got into the real world and I found out I knew nothing. 
So that was a really good, it, I was very unhappy, but it was a good experience for me because I was really like, you get with your, your feet on the, on the ground. And then after uh, 11 months or so, I got a job at the bank and then at the bank seat, it was a Belgian uh, debit card operator. And from then on, I worked there uh, until uh, two, three years ago, 2017, I think, that I stopped there when I got here full time at the university. And there um, I got at Bunch, I got some freedom of my uh, then boss, who, who stayed my boss actually for uh, 22 years, uh, where I could work on our uh, Rheindal proposal for the NIST competition. So I got some freedom to do that. And after I won that, I got a lot of freedom. And so I could do their research in collaboration with Jill and Mikael and, 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 and Guido and later Ronnie and Seth Hoffer um, with kind of isolated from the top layers of, of the company. So they, they were, the, the company was not really uh, concerned that we could do free research. So no pressure to publish which you have in academia, if I see postdocs, it's really a tough life because they have to really show that they're independent researchers and them. And we could just do research. And uh, if a paper at uh, ePrint Archive or a paper at some uh, eCrypt workshop or a paper at crypto, there was no difference. And that's where we could uh, take the time and the reflection and the distance to do all this work on Ketchup, basically sponge-based crypto that we kind of invented. There. So kind of we invented a new type of symmetric crypto there. That's how I see it. And that goes on till this, this day. And I don't think in academia, I would have had that opportunity, but that's a, it's a very particular uh, thing because in many uh, big companies, you will not get the occasion to do that. I think even now the climate is much more result driven while we got a lot of freedom so I, I cannot make like a good statement but i think you should kind of follow your feeling yeah? where, where you feel good if you if you are in a research group where you feel at home and you feel good then try to to stay there but of course a postdoc also should see other places and, and get some other experience uh, but so yeah I, I can't i can only tell from my experience and i, I really was lucky i was always frustrated when working for industry that I was not like a professor or not appreciated enough. I always have that, you know that. But actually I was quite lucky because we were in our own bubble, let's say, where we could do research independent of what was hot at the moment. So there was a lot of trends. We just looked at our own trends and we, we followed that. So actually bouncing on what you were saying, what is hot at the, at the moment, mm -hmm. um, what um that's actually uh that was the question i wanted to ask you uh like what do you think would would be uh that people will be looking at in the symmetric uh, crypto community um, area and that's a question by uh, Fukong. so could you describe your feelings on how the symmetric key cryptography will go in the near future would there be yeah. new uh, competition after that what's what's your take on that yeah um yeah, it's, uh, I cannot really answer the question how it will go because I don't know how it will go. But I can tell what I think is interesting and where I would like to do research that I can do. Uh, where it will go, yeah, there will be competitions. But I think these competitions are just a snapshot. I, I would like to, to think about the long term. So what would be kind of the best possible crypto system? So I already tried to do that with Subterranean at the time by saying, what is the long term? The long term is ASIC. The long term is a dedicated hardware. So you see that also in AES now, as, as soon as something is widespread, then you can afford to do it in hardware. So that was at the time, so if you have good crypto, but then of course you need to build confidence and so on. So it's, it's in my mind is always like, what would be the cost metric? The cost metric would be implementation hardware. And I think, uh, the energy per bit is a good cost metric and maybe also um, yeah, the speed, but yeah, but they're kind of related, of course. Huh? So I think in symmetric crypto, you got, um, you got, of course, the unkeyed, so the hashing, but let's look at the keyed. So I think it's, it, there's three things. There is keyed compression. So where you basically take a message of variable length and you compress it to a fixed length uh, state. Then you get keyed expansion, 
where you take some fixed length state and you basically stream cipher as a stream cipher. Right? Um, and then if you do this key compression, well, in parallel, you need a lot of masks and you have this mask generation. It's kind of a variant of the key expansion. And if you, you can solve these three problems, you can build an efficient deck function. And if you got an efficient deck function, you can do everything. So block ciphers may still be useful for some niche cases, but for really the bulk of the work, you can use these deck functions. And if you got one good deck function, that's in my opinion, all you need. Um, and I like to look at the degree to round functions. Basically, I got this European grant that is dedicated to the research of degree, degree to round functions. Um, I like this, uh, these mixing layers that are not MDS, but that are much more uh, like, like these column parity mixers, things like that, non-aligned. And what I think is also important that that is now, um, there may be a good time finally to do it, is to have a good write-up of attacks. So you see a lot in symmetric crypto, especially cryptanalysis, that people do not take the enough effort and time to do a good write-up of their attacks. And these papers are still accepted. But there is no urgency. If you look at the long term, we just need to have better understanding of what the attacks are and how well they work. And for that, we need a good write-up. And that's what I try to look at. And I always prefer to look at round functions that are nice, have nice structure, like a lot of symmetry and a lot of uniformity. So that's to, to also have some kind of aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing uh, things. Okay. Okay. I don't know where it's really going, that I don't know. Okay, yeah, but that's that's your take on, on this. That's where I wanted to go, that I know. Um, actually, since you're, you're, you're um, You've been uh, pushing a lot. I mean, uh, uh, creating this domain of sponge function and, and, and worked a lot since all these years in providing new primitives, new permutation, and new um, different variants. Um, one question is you have collaborated with uh, the same group of people, especially for, for Kechak. I think uh, yeah, there's a core of, uh, of designers. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, how do you stay critical and prevent tunnel vision? Yeah, that's it. I think it's a very good question. It's actually a question of one of my students <laughs> I saw. Um, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, I think it's something that you cannot prevent. You can always create tunnel vision and start believing your own bullshit. So what helps in the ketchup team, at least, is that we are very critical for each other. So, um, Gilles and Michael, they will remember, uh, me and Guido too, in the beginning, we had often, uh, very uh, harsh discussions. But it was not personal. It was more about ideas. And in the end, we would kind of always agree on a common approach. But there would be really a very opposite uh, points of view. And that helps, of course. But as you yeah, go through the years, of course, that can become less. And you can have this, this pathological, pathological group thinking where you all think the same. And it's all wrong. So I think it's, it's something hard to avoid. So now, for instance, with my... Um, uh, my PhD students that I have, I have uh, quite a number of PhD students. I am afraid of that because I'm kind of dominating. Eh? I'm not shouting very loud and so on. And they're just started, so they're maybe a bit intimidated. And I'm, uh, yeah, it's, it's a risk. So th the only way to counter that is that people should, should speak up and should, um, um, should provide counter arguments eh? and also read other people's papers. So I, I try to stimulate that. But at the same time, of course, I want to be right. I always want to be right. Yeah? So, but I think it's it's normal to want to be right. And you can. It's hard to be your own critic, because you're just too close to the subject. So it it is a risk, I think. And and yeah. But I think the person himself, in, in this case, so in in my research group, I kind of dominate, and I don't want that. But it's just a fact. Uh, and I can't. I can't do anything about that myself. I need my people around me to not be just like these people that say yes. And you see that often with dictators, uh, they are surrounded by people that say yes, because the people that don't say yes, they, are, they have been uh, exterminated. I don't want to be someone like that. Um, talking about um, other, maybe different work from what you have been working on, I, I see two questions on, on, on um, 
for example, one question: What do you? What is your take on future of symmetric uh, of symmetric cryptography adapted for MPC applications? And also, what's your take on too much crypto paper from Jean-Philippe Masson? So, what's what's your your view on these uh, trends that you start to see that's not maybe not originated from you? Yes, yes. <clears throat> the, the first question I didn't get. What is that? Is it uh, the first? The, the first one is um, what about uh, symmetrically cryptography primitives for MPC application, for example, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think it's fine, uh, and I, I think people uh, should do that. But I don't feel. Um, I find it very hard to believe the use cases. So I always try to, to understand what the real use case is. And then they say homomorphic encryption or something. And then the example to me sounds always very artificial. So I think it's fine to work on. I think there's a lot of interesting mathematical challenges there. Uh, and um, it also broadens our view on cryptography, symmetric crypto, because we're always working in bit with bits, huh, GF2. And then we look at GFP, which is quite a, a good thing because you take some distance and you see other things than you see with the microscopic view. Um, and then you ask something about uh, Jean-Philippe Masson. Yeah, the other one is, would you feel comfortable? I mean, does it, in, in this paper is, is uh, talking about like the security margin that you might get and is, yeah. is not proposing this, but is, uh, is analyzing if it would be possible to potentially reduce the number of fronts for the S. Yeah. Would you feel comfortable with that? No, would but you increase I, it maybe or <laughs> no i think uh, he raises a number of uh, good points it's a good discussion so it's uh, it's a discussion worth having so often in these competitions that's uh, something that is not really treated very well what is the margin and uh, it should be discussed but uh, let's say i think uh, jean philippe omasson is a very good uh, communicator um and he, he succeeds actually in pushing his stuff very, very well in uh, these uh, places like uh, IETF. But um, I think it's, it's most of the design ideas, yeah, they go back to Dan Bernstein. So I always like to do design and this promotional aspect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then you get your stuff all over the place and it's implemented all over, but, but what do you get? I, I think it's nice to build something Beautiful. That's that's actually the thing I, I like to do. And uh, so, for instance, ARX for me. Uh, so that's that's there is something dirty there. But um, yeah, some ARX is also quite symmetrical. So it's a matter of taste. It's not. But, there's no but, objective. But don't taste. you think it? Uh, don't you think it goes exactly in the direction that you were saying? I mean, I'm, personally, I'm not a big fan either of ARX. But don't you think it goes in the direction? And in, in exactly direction. what it does. Uh, don't you, don't you, I mean, I'm also not a big fan of Eric's, but don't you think it goes in the direction of not being aligned? Now, yeah, this yeah. weak alignment, I mean, it, it, it's, it's actually one of the, and the problem is that it's hard to analyze, actually. It is clearly not aligned. Yeah, there I fully agree. But um, so you can also do uh, non-aligned uh, structures where you can get good bounds. And for ARX, it will not be so easy to get good bounds. Indeed. I have never seen any uh, uh, reasonably good bounds so for ARX. Well, I think for, uh, yeah, for Zulu, I think we got really some great bounds on, uh, on trails. But of course, I'm not objective. Huh? No, but I'm sure we're going to see a lot of work on all this in the, in the future years. That, yeah. That, uh, that I'm, I'm confi confident about this. Um, actually, bouncing on this. Um, so I, I remember I saw a talk uh, at ENS a long time ago by Vincent Hyman. He was saying that. Um, like there was kind of a disappointment on, on how fast AES, I mean, Rindal was uh, deployed actually in the industry and somehow it was believed that it will go faster. And now what's yeah. your take on, on what happens with uh, Ketchak now? Do you think it goes fast enough, not fast enough? Would you recommend people from moving away from SHA-2 to SHA-3 or no, SHA-2 is good enough? Yeah, so um, it took, I think, um, it was 2012 when um, NIST chose Ketchak, eh, as, as three, and it took three more years for it to become the FIPS. So I think that was quite uh, shocking. And then um, the whole idea of uh, what we proposed was sh shake function, so uh, ZOFs. Eh? And uh, they are still now not recommended as a binist as um, uh, hash. So they, they look more at this. this uh, how do you call that? Uh, Drop-in replacements, eh? so SHA-3, uh, 256, SHA-3, uh, 384. 
well, I think it would be time to, to go to use these insights. So, of course, I think it doesn't go fast enough. Yeah. And um, so there's a big movement eh, against um, NSA originating ciphers. So, uh, it, at the uh, ISO level. Yeah. So, um, for instance, Simon and uh, Speck. Uh, Simon, I think it basically is also technically a nice cipher. Speck, I don't like so much because it's ARX. Uh, so there's a big movement, uh, but at the same time, there is uh, nobody apparently has a problem with SHA-256, which is also originating from NSA. So I find that a bit um, disappointing that the cryptographic community doesn't uh, apparently is uh, very worried about uh, Simon and Speck, but has no opinion apparently about uh, SHA-256. That being said, I don't think that SHA-256 uh, that there are weaknesses or so, that that is not. No, no Simon. Simon neither. Really? neither. Simon no. neither. You don't Simon think also Simon has, has any weakness? No, Simon neither. No, 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 yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's not about, um, it's not about cryptography. I feel more like politics, but I think the politics are not consistent, you know? But maybe there's something I'm missing. Um, I, actually, I realize we are already, I mean, this is, this went very fast, actually. Yeah. Um, we are already over time. Uh, Itai, Gaetan, can we ask one more question or should we stop there? <laughs> I don't want to, I'm not sure. It's okay with me if you want to continue on. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you can continue. Um, Yo Johanna, I mean, so, uh, you so like five minutes, not, uh, not much more, but uh, five minutes I think would be fine. Yeah, I'll have my lunch five minutes later, it's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got one question from Maria. Have you or any of the Ketchak designers ever tried to study the property of the inverse of the theta function for Ketchak? Yeah, it's a very good question. And um, we did actually. So, but uh, what are the properties? So if you look at branch numbers, the same over mapping and its inverse. And also a lot of properties are the same. It's not, it's not a specific property of a cipher, but we looked at algebraic properties. And at this paper, column parity mixers, I think it's cited two or three times together with co uh, where we investigate this kind of mappings. It's a TOS paper. And there we actually uh, give results on the order of such a function. Yeah. And if you have a function, it's a linear function, so it's a linear mapping, and these linear mappings, they form a group. And uh, the order, of course, of any element defies the order of the group. So you can easily find the inverse by just uh, doing uh, the uh, mapping to the order minus one. Yeah? Then you get the inverse. And uh, this, there is an efficient way to implement it using that trick that we didn't publish yet. We know about it. We discussed it, Gilles and I but we still have to publish it. And uh, actually this trick we learned from reverse engineering, something that uh, Mike Hamburg gave us. So Mike Hamburg actually figured it out or he never explicitly explained it to us, but from his code, we could reverse engineering uh, reverse engineer what he was doing. It's quite sophisticated. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe, okay, maybe one last question. Let me just um, refresh the page because I see comments arriving. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe one last question about uh, what's your, okay, we, we, need, we need a question on quantum computing, of course, otherwise yes. it will not be a, a proper Ask Me Anything session. So what is your opinion about the impact of quantum computing on the symmetry crypto community? Yeah. And what's also, what's your, your take on the, the, the Q1 and Q2 model? So which one? Yeah. Relevant. Um, Q2 not? model, I think it's really long term. So it's more like uh, for an... Uh, some hundreds of centuries, maybe, that we're going to do that. That's what I think. And um, yeah, Q1, yeah. I, I personally am not so convinced there will be a quantum computer. So I've been hearing it for 20 years. And I, I hear a lot of noise, but I don't see any actual progress in, let's say, factoring or so. And then I always hear these sophisticated explanations, but I just don't see any progress. So maybe I'm wrong. I don't care so much. Okay, um, so maybe maybe one day we'll see you design a new permutation, quantum resistance, quantum <laughs> computing resistant uh, permutation. Maybe one day. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll learn about that. It really will work. I see. Yeah. Um, I think I think we should. Yeah, it's real over time. Is there? There's a question about um, like, is there some work you would like to promote? Uh, you have been talking a, a bit about this, but do you want to send the last message about? Uh, 
some work you would like to promote uh, from what you have been doing in the, in the future, like something you, should, you think really people should take a look at right now or they should contact, contact you maybe to work with you on something? No, yeah, I've, 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 for the moment I have my research groups quite busy, so I cannot okay. take <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, thanks a lot for, uh, for all your, your replies. And yeah. uh, I think this closes the session. Uh, let's thank you and yeah, okay. Thanks uh, for having me. Okay, th thanks a lot, uh, Thomas and Johan, for a great, uh, great session. And uh, I think uh, th thank you all, all the moderators and the speakers uh, throughout the day. And uh, I think uh, we'll we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. And uh, um, submit your uh, talks to the RAM session, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.